All right, well, welcome back to Linear Algebra for this, our final video lecture of the fall 2020 semester. I'll tell you something about self-adjoint operators and then uh, be able to answer that question. Remember, our kind of motivating question was, under what circumstances does an operator on a complex <clears throat> uh, inner product space have an orthonormal basis of eigenvectors? We kind of ended the previous lecture last time talking about normal operators. We proved that um, that uh, if you have an orthonormal uh, basis of eigenvectors, then your operator is normal in the sense that uh, the composition of it and its adjoints in, in either order is, is, are equal. So our first theorem here, 6.16, says that that condition is actually uh, um, sufficient in addition to being necessary, provided that you have a finite dimensional complex inner product space. All right, <clears throat> so that's what the theorem says. If you take an operator on a complex inner product space that's finite dimensional, then that operator is normal if and only if uh, you can find an orthonormal basis of eigenvectors. So, so for operators over finite dimensional complex uh, inner product spaces, being normal is equivalent to being diagonalizable by eigen by uh, by orthonormal basis of eigenvectors. All right, we've already proved in one direction of this. We proved last time that that if you um, have an orthonormal basis of eigenvectors, then the operator is normal. Remember, normal just means that this composition t star with t is equal to the composition of t with t star. So we really just have to focus on the other direction. Okay. So we'll see where, where, why that complex part has to come in right away here. So suppose we take some normal operator. So T is an operator on a complex dimension, complex finite dimensional inner product space that satisfies T star T is T T star. And here's where the complex field comes in. I'm gonna use the so-called fundamental theorem of algebra. The characteristic polynomial splits. Every polynomial over the complex field splits, can factor into a product of linear factors. That's not true over the real numbers, but it is true over the complex numbers. So that's where we're using the fact that it's a complex inner product space. So the characteristic polynomial of this normal operator is guaranteed to split. Okay, so then we invoke Schur's theorem. That was theorem 6.14 from last time. If the, if, the, if the characteristic polynomial splits, then we get an orthonormal basis for which the matrix, uh, I'm gonna denote it by, by A for short of this operator in this basis is upper triangular. Okay, going for diagonal, but, but at least we get an upper triangular matrix uh, uh, via Schur. Okay, so, so this thing's upper triangular. Well, that means in particular in its first column, the only non-zero entry is in the first row. The first column are the coefficients of the image of the first basis vector, that's V1 in our notation. So that means that that V1 must be an eigenvector. Right, A sub one one is just the entry in the one one position of the matrix A. And, and that thing has to be an eigenvector because uh, it's the only non-zero entry in that column. So, so uh, V1 is an eigenvector for T with entry A1 with eigenvalue A11, okay? So now again, it's an upper triangular matrix. So T of V2, well, it doesn't use any coefficients after V2. Below the diagonal, the entries are all zero. So T of V2, looks like A12V1 plus A22V2. And if you wanna know what that coefficient A12 is, we can just take the dot product of this vector with, with the basis vector V1. We have an orthonormal basis. So if you wanna know the coefficient of a vector, you, you take the inner product with the corresponding basis vector. So that's what I'm doing down here. A12, the coefficient that I want, well, it's just T of V2 uh, inner product of V1. V1 because I want the coefficient of that vector, all right? But if you push that inner pro, if, or sorry, if you, if you move T across the comma, replacing it with its adjoint, that inner product is the inner product of V2 with T star. And now I'm gonna use uh, um, the theorem from last time that if uh, you have an eigenvector for T, it's also an eigenvector for T star, a normal operator with the eigenvalue that's the conjugate. So, so I'm looking back up here when I say this, since T of V1 is A11 V1, T star of it is the conjugate of A11 times V1. So that's by that theorem. Then I'm just gonna move my 
coefficient out, it comes out of the second coordinate, so it loses the conjugation bar. But really what I'm focusing on here is that V1 and V2 came from an orthonormal basis. They're different basis vectors, so they're orthogonal. All right, so this coefficient A2, A12, excuse me, is zero. So really, I'll write this in a different color because I'm adding it here now. Uh, T of V2, uh, A12 is equal to zero, we just proved. So this thing just reduces to A22 times V2. So V2 is also an eigenvector, All right? That's the punchline. V2 is also an eigenvector. Uh, uh, its coefficient, uh, its eigenvalue is A22. Cool. All right, and then we're just gonna kind of play the same game. I could, could write an induction proof. I decided just to sort of put this in a and so on. So, so again, our matrix A is upper triangular. So if we take T of V3, there's no zero coefficients below the diagonal. So T of V3 would involve at most the vectors V1, V2, and V3 in its linear combination. And then I'm just gonna kind of find these things using the same way. If I wanna know what the coefficient of A of V1 is, that, that is my A13, well, I take the dot product of T of V3 with V1. And by the same argument as above, I won't, I won't recapitulate it all in complete detail. You move T over, uh, uh, it, V1 is an eigenvector for T, so it's an eigenvector for T star as well. Uh, uh, when the eigenvalue comes out, it gets a conjugate, uh, and by orthogonality, that product is zero. Same thing uh, uh, if you want to know uh, uh, A23. A23 is the coefficient of V2, so you take the dot product or the inner product with V2. Same exact reasoning, okay, you get zero. It's probably a reasonable place to stop the video and make sure that that, that makes sense the details of the computation. So at the end of the day, we find out that T of V3 uh, is, is just a scalar multiple of V3. That is V3 is also an eigenvector. Its eigenvalue is A33. So, and so on. Formally, we could do it by induction. For every J between one and N, you can find out that T of Vj is really just a scalar multiple of Vj. So this orthonormal basis beta that we had uh, that made the matrix upper triangular actually makes that matrix diagonal. Every one of those basis vectors is actually an eigenvalue for T. All right, so that completes the proof. If T is a normal operator, where did we use the normality? Uh, if you're kind of looking in this proof, the only place I explicitly use the normality is when I was invoking theorem 6.15C. Theorem 6.15C requires T to be normal. So if you're normal over a complex space, that upper triangular matrix actually has to be diagonal. That is, you have a basis of eigenvectors. So that's, that's the answer to our question. Our question was, under what circumstances does an operator on a complex vector space, inner product space, have a basis of uh, an orthonormal basis of eigenvectors? The answer to the question is if and only if it's a normal operator. Okay. It's kind of why we introduced the adjoint is because normality is this property that's defined in terms of the adjoint. Um, I want to point out by an example here that if you restrict yourself to real inner product spaces, that theorem is false. All right, so, so uh, just as a quick example, if we take an operator on, say, a real vector space, inner product space with the usual inner product, it's going to be the rotation. We didn't really talk about this uh, too much, but we can. Uh, uh, this matrix the, whose entries are sine and cosine of an angle, I'm taking the angle here between zero and pi strictly. Uh, uh, the matrix representation of the rotation of the plane by that angle is given by this matrix A in the standard basis. Uh, that matrix A uh, uh, if you take its complex conjugate transpose, it's really just its transpose because the entries in the matrix are real. And you can glance at the matrix and see that that transpose is just the negative of A. It's a so-called skew symmetric matrix. So if you multiply A by A star in either order, in either case, you're gonna just get minus A squared. So this matrix is normal. The matrix is normal. That's what the author is writing right here. And if the matrix is normal in any basis, then so is the operator. All right, so, so rotation by an angle theta between 0 and 2 pi is a normal operator on the real inner product space R2 with the standard inner product. Uh, uh, but, but not only is there, there no base, there's no basis of uh, orthonormal basis of eigenvectors, this matrix doesn't even have any eigenvectors. 
You could prove that by looking at its characteristic polynomial. You could look at it in all kinds of ways. I'm just going to use ge geometry here. Uh, this matrix rotates the plane for any non-zero vector v. When you apply a to that v, the vector that you get is just the rotation of v through the angle theta. Well, uh, if theta is not zero or pi, that direction a v is not v and it's not minus v. So, so this, this matrix has no eigenvectors at all. So there's no basis of eigenvectors because it doesn't have any eigenvectors. So it's a normal operator, but it doesn't have any eigenvectors. Why is it rotten or well, why doesn't it contradict the theorem above? Well, because we're only looking at it over the real field. If you looked at this same uh, uh, map as a, um, an operator on the complex vector space C2, then it does have eigenvectors. It has a basis of an orthonormal basis of eigenvectors, but those eigenvectors and are, are those eigenvalues are not going to be real. They're going to be complex numbers. Cool. Okay, so that kind of sets up the question like, well, what is the answer for uh, operators over real inner product spaces? When, when do they have an orthonormal basis? Evidently, normality is not good enough. Okay, so we're going to end this uh, whole course here by trying to answer that question. So, so here's the main definition. We're going to call a matrix self-adjoint. Some people call it Hermitian, but I'm going to stick to just self-adjoint. Uh, if it's adjoint, is itself. It's kind of a natural term for it. For matrices, matrices are self-adjoint if their matrix adjoint is itself, okay? Uh, uh, because of the relationship between operators and matrices and orthonormal bases, that an operator is self-adjoint if and only if its matrix is in any orthonormal basis, okay? Moreover, uh, if you're self-adjoint, then you're normal. I've kind of sketched out a little proof of that here because uh, if you look at T times T star, T composed with T star, well, if it's self-adjoint, T star is equal to T. So T times T star is just T squared. But again, you can think of that as T star squared because T is equal to T if it's self-adjoint. And that's T star times T star, but you can replace the second uh, T star with T because it's self-adjoint. So, so T star T is, is uh, or T T star is T star T. So, so if you're self-adjoint, then you're normal. The converse is not necessarily true. Okay. So as a little lemma here, if you take a, a self-adjoint operator, so some operator that, that t is equal to t star on a finite dimensional inner product space, real or complex, uh, uh, first of all, every one of its eigenvalues are real. So even if it's a if it's a self-adjoint operator over a real or over a complex space, it can only have real eigenvalues. Is the first part, uh, and then the second part is that if v is a real inner product space then the characteristic polynomial of this uh, uh, self-adjoint operator splits. And I mean splits over R. So it factors completely over the real numbers into linear factors. Okay, so we'll prove these things one at a time. Here's the proof of A. Let, let's take a, an eigenvalue for T, all right? So we have to prove every eigenvalue is real. So let's suppose that it has an eigenvalue, lambda. Uh, and what would that mean? That means there's some non-zero vector V that T of V is lambda times V. Okay, so, so uh, T is self-adjoint, so it's normal, all right? We said that above. So this uh, eigenvector is also an eigenvector for the adjoint. Uh, we proved that by theorem 6.15, uh, and its eigenvalue is lambda bar, right? But uh, T star of V is T of V, because T star is equal to T. So if we put all that together, this lambda v, which is t of v, but that's t star of v, that's lambda bar of v. So the only way lambda times v is equal to lambda bar times v is if lambda is equal to lambda bar. So, so an, a complex number that's its own conjugate has to be a real number. Cool, so that's the proof of part A. For part B, let's suppose that we've got a real inner product space uh, a T is, is this uh, self-adjoint operator on it. And I wanna show that um, the characteristic polynomial splits. Okay, so let's pick an orthonormal basis for our vector space. And let's let the matrix for this operator in that basis be denoted by A. So, so in particular, A would be some N by N real matrix and it's self-adjoint, right? Because we're assuming that the operator T is self-adjoint. 
this is a little bit subtle, but that matrix A with real entries, we can still think about left multiplying complex vectors by it. So L sub A applied to the complex inner product space CN. Uh, if I look at that operator L sub A in the standard basis, its matrix would be A. So, so L sub A is also self-adjoint as an operator on the complex inner product space, okay? So, well, by what we just proved, all the eigenvalues of that operator L sub A are real because it's a self-adjoint operator. So eigenvalues are real. The fundamental theorem of algebra says that it's characteristic polynomial. So F sub L sub A has to split over T. Every polynomial splits over T, but the zeros of it are all real. The zeros of that characteristic polynomial are our eigenvalues. So if those things are all real, then this polynomial F sub L sub A, this characteristic polynomial, it's actually splitting over the real numbers, okay? But the characteristic polynomial of, of that operator L sub A, that's just the characteristic polynomial of the matrix A, which is also the characteristic polynomial of our operator T on the real vector space, right? So, so uh, uh, that means that F sub T, our characteristic polynomial splits over R. Cool. Okay, so now we can state and prove the uh, final and main theorem of the section. Uh, it's an answer to the question, uh, if you're talking about operators on real inner product spaces, finite dimensional real inner product spaces, when do they admit uh, an orthonormal basis of eigenvectors? Well, it's if and only if they're self-joint. So if you take uh, uh, if you take T to be an, an operator on a finite dimensional real inner product space, right? So I won't be able to use the fundamental theorem of algebra this time, but the uh, theorem says that that operator is self-adjoint if and only if there's an orthonormal basis consisting of eigenvectors. Okay, so that's the answer to the question over real spaces. When do they have an orthonormal basis of eigenvectors? It's when uh, T is equal to T star. Right, so let's try to prove it. Let, let's first uh, take the direction where we suppose we have an orthonormal basis of eigenvectors. Okay, so that means that the matrix of T in that basis is a diagonal matrix. Its diagonal entries are the eigenvalues, right? Diagonal matrices are symmetric when you, um, when you uh, uh, take their transpose, you get the matrix back, right? This is a matrix with real entries, and so uh, the complex conjugates of them are all themselves. So, so that matrix will be self-adjoint, right? So, so uh, a matrix A equaling A star over the real numbers is, is equivalent to A equaling its transpose because the conjugates don't do anything, okay? So we have a self-adjoint operator. Uh, if we look at the matrix of the adjoint of that operator in base in beta basis, because beta is an orthonormal basis, we know that that's the matrix of T's adjoint. But but the matrix of T's adjoint uh, uh, is equal to itself because it's a symmetric matrix. All right. So so what does that mean? That means the matrix of T star is equal to the matrix of T in this beta basis. Well, the only way that can happen is if T and T star are actually the same operator. So T itself has to be self-adjoint. Okay, so the summary is if you have an orthonormal basis of eigenvectors, then uh, uh, in that basis, the matrix is going to be symmetric and then that makes the, uh, uh, the operator's adjoint equal itself. So you have a self-adjoint operator. So that's one half. The other half is that if you have a self-adjoint operator, Okay, well then uh, by the lemma we just proved, it's characteristic polynomial splits over the real numbers. Okay, an uh, operator whose characteristic polynomial splits satisfies the hypothesis of Schur's theorem. So Schur's theorem says that we get some orthonormal basis for which the matrix of that operator is maybe not diagonal, but it's upper triangular. So because the characteristic polynomial splits, the matrix is upper triangular. But this operator is self-adjoint, yeah? So that means that its matrix in the beta basis has to be the uh, matrix of its adjoint because T is equal to T star, but the matrix of its adjoint is the matrix adjoint of T, right? 
So, uh, but if you take an upper triangular matrix and you look at its conjugate transpose, you get a lower triangular matrix, right? The transpose of an upper triangular matrix is lower triangular. So this matrix of T in the beta basis, it's upper triangular, but it's also lower triangular. But a matrix that's upper triangular and lower triangular has to be diagonal. So this matrix of T in the beta basis is actually a diagonal matrix which means that every one of those elements of beta is an eigenvector. So, so, so we must have this orthonormal basis of eigenvectors. Okay, well, thanks for listening. <laughs>